evening and welcome to the third Thursday lecture series for Greater New York Mensa. I'm Anton Spivak, I'm in charge of the series, and this month's speaker is Rodney Johnson, an activist, actor, businessman, and playwright. I was in a play of his two years ago, Sierra Leone on stage, about the history of this West African country and the corruption plaguing it. And Rodney is here to discuss the cycle of violence or the nature of man. A piece on human nature. Yes, sir. Take it away. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> well, thank you for having me, um, Anton, or well, even inviting me over here to um, speak on this subject matter. I mean, obviously, I chose the subject matter. <laughs> I chose the subject matter because it's uh, it's very personal to me, actually. But before I delve into my uh, my topic for tonight. I uh, would just like a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Rodney Johnson. I, um, I was born and bred in Liberia for about nine years. Um, and then the war kicked in, in Liberia in 89. There was a civil war, so I had to leave and uh, we went to Sierra Leone, that's where my dad is from. And subsequently, um, a civil war um, ensued in Sierra Leone again. So that was like jumping from the frying pan to the fire kind of thing. So I endured two civil war, civil wars. Um, um, my childhood was not a very normal one because of this experience, but it actually made me a better person moving on in life. So I actually produced a play when I came to Sierra Leone based on some of these experiences, especially as um, in reference to the war in Sierra Leone, um, which was uh, very traumatizing. I saw things no kids should ever see, you know, people being amputated you know, tens of thousands of people losing their life. So I decided to uh, take this experience to the stage, you know, because the stage is very powerful, you know, in conveying such message, you know, at least people will know and hear about this. Um, <clears throat> I'm also an entrepreneur. I have my uh, business, I do fashion accessories. Uh, it's called Zuri, uh, which is a brand I just launched into um, last year. And I'm an activist and an actor. I am delighted to be here tonight. Um, with the subject matter for me to, tonight, um, I actually wanted to talk about um, <coughs> corruption in Sierra Leone, which was a theme in the play that I produced two years ago, Lion Mountain, Sierra Leone Stage. But corruption, I, I thought, was too uh, uh, sort of vague in a way, and uh, people might not really connect with that. And I realized, uh, talking about the cycle of violence or the nature of men, that's a deeper subject matter. And uh, it's actually very personal. Personal in a way, my story is very personal. My name is Rodney Johnson. That's a slave name. People ask me all the time, how are you called Rodney Johnson and you were born in Liberia, West Africa? Very simple. Um, at the end of the slave trade, slaves were, some slaves were taken from America, some went to West Africa, willingly, of course. Those who decided to stay are what we call the African Americans today, and they still have the, slave, the names of the slave masters. So in a way, I might be um, actually <laughs> related to some uh, African Americans over here, if I check my ancestry DNA. Okay. But the interesting thing about the history of Liberia was slaves, some of the slaves that left America and went to Liberia, these slaves took with them the identity of the slave masters. They took with them the, the names of the slave masters, the Western civilization and culture and everything else. They embraced, the, they embraced these, these um, fundamental um, traits. Um, <clears throat> Most people will look at what happened in Liberia because these people went over there. They endured slavery in America for over 245 years in America. They were subjugated. I don't want to elaborate on the impact of slavery because we all know. But the point of this, this um, topic is these slaves, they tasted freedom for the first time. And they went to Liberia. What ensued was they actually took it upon themselves to oppress the indigenous Liberians for another 127 years. So now you know why it's personal, because I was born in Liberia, and my ancestors are free slaves. So I question um, 
this um, event that unfolded in Liberia. After reading the history of Liberia, after experiencing the war in Liberia, everything is actually linked. The slavery, the end of slavery, slaves going to Liberia, and the slave, the freed slaves actually subjugated, subjugated the native uh, indigenous Liberians and oppressing them for over 127 years. Most of us will be quick to say, oh, this is a cycle of violence. Most people will come to that conclusion. And it is a rational conclusion to come to, to say, oh yes, it's a cycle of violence. That's what they were taught. That's what they knew. That's what they've seen. You know, you know, we'll say power corrupt. Absolute power corrupt. Absolutely, correct? You know, we all we all have the propensity to be uh, in control and to be, to be greedy for power. But yeah, I think that's for me, that's very, very uh, <clears throat> shallow in a way. You know, I think, I strongly believe the cycle of violence somehow played a role in what occurred in uh, what transpired in Liberia. But to a larger extent, the nature of man is what responsible, was what was responsible for what occurred in Liberia. Because oftentimes we, uh, we tend to uh, be politically correct and try to stay away from pointing out fact and dealing with issue, you know, as they uh, presented to us. We tend to be politically correct. I'll talk about politically correct, you know, I'll just stray away from my subject a little bit and make reference to Donald Trump, the election of Trump. Trump was elected partly because of political correctness from the liberal left, you know, be it the media or be it ourselves, you know, because we don't want to talk about things. We don't want to address issues that people felt needed to be addressed, people on the right, or whatever the case might be. Trump, they found something in Trump that most people did not, you know, they, they did not feel they have that, that confidence, they did not feel they have that, that trust. Trump gave them that possibility. You know, Trump gave them that voice. You know, so people, for the first time, some people began to speak freely in America. Now, trust me, I do not agree with most of the stuff people were saying on their rights. I do not agree with it. But the point is, oftentimes we are so politically correct in our, in our um, assessment of issues that we forget we are human. We forget that we should be able to talk about issues. We should be able to to just listen to the other side, you know. So I'm going back to my point. You know, when I say the nature of man was the cause of what happened, we all have we all have the propensity to be good and the propensity to be evil. That's a fact. Now, most people will look at what transpired in Liberia and just just come to the conclusion that, like I said earlier, is uh, is that the uh, uh, is the cycle of violence. No, it's not the cycle of violence. Think about it. These people were black, the free slaves, they were black. They endured hardship and subjugation from the white men, and they went to Liberia to gain freedom. They decided to do the same, oppress the native black brothers in Africa, which was Liberia. It's not a cycle of violence, it's just the nature of us. We have the tendency to be evil. And, and what is that, that drive? That drive for power, that drive for control. It's in us. You know, they had choice. That's where choice comes into this, folks. You know, we all have the choice. <laughs> you know, we all have that conscience, you know, to be able to determine what's right and what's wrong. So obviously, the cycle of violence played some role. But the nature of man in this case was definitely a, a, was definitely a bigger factor in what transpired in Liberia. And so I was born in this, um, in this culture. I was born in this situation. Liberians, you know, you had the, the so-called uh, elite who were the slaves, the generations of free slaves in Liberia. They took over Liberia and they ruled Liberia for 127 years. And the native people, they had no say. They were second class citizens in their own country. They could not even vote. They could not even hold governmental position. This went on for 127 years. You know, so oftentimes we are quick to point to racism for everything. You know, we blame slavery. We say, yes, slavery was evil. Yes, it was evil. You know, we always want to point fingers at the white man. But just, let's just think for a second. If black people were in the position of power like the white man was, they would have done the same thing. I strongly believe that. I strongly believe that. 
that would have been the same case. You can talk about what happened in South Africa, you know, as an example too. White people went over there because they had the power and they subjugated the black South African. It's power. Power corrupt, absolute power corrupt, absolutely. You can talk about the Israeli-Palestinian situation. It's power. It has nothing really to do with race. It has nothing to do with cycle of violence. Cycle of violence plays some role, but it's not the, the, the rational conclusion. It's not the end all be all. So it is my hope that you know we as people, we as nation, will be able to address issues with all um, honesty and not be so politically correct when we talk about issues. Let's just be, most people wouldn't, most people, I'm sure some of us actually know the facts in all of these issues, but we are just um, afraid to say it. You know, so the easiest thing would be like, oh yes, we blame the white men for everything that's going on in the world. No, I did a play called Lion Mountain, Anton was in that play. You know, most people will be thinking, oh, I would talk about, you know, what's going on uh, in the world, you know, the role of the white men in Africa. You know, when you talk about uh, the economic, the, the, the um, how you call it, uh, when you talk about the, the role of economics in the world, also you have the IMF, the role the IMF plays in the world and all that stuff. You know, you have structural adjustment programs that's been imposed in Africa by, by Western um, government. You know, it is not only limited to that. Sierra Leone, for example, we gained independence in 1961. After independence, it's a rhetorical question. What did we do with the independence? We had an opportunity for self, um, self-dominance. We had the opportunity, you know, to actually rule our country for the first time. But instead, we delve into corruption. We delve into mismanagement. We delve into tribalism. We delve into nepotism. So how do we point fingers at the white man for all this, the mess that went on in Sierra Leone and not look into the mirror and see what we did wrong or what we could have done differently. That's the question I asked myself and that's the reason why I decided to produce that play. And for this reason, that's the reason why I decided to write a book on this very subject matter, the nature of men or the cycle of violence. So I thank you for your audience. So, <laughs> um, so how do you define the cycle of violence? The cycle of violence in relationship has a, diff a different has a different definition, obviously. You know, you have different stages of abuse and all of that stuff. It's different. When you talk about the cycle of violence as it relates to international relations, as it relates to historical events, mm -hmm. it's different. Cycle of violence, I actually touched on that. You have slaves who were um, subjugated in America for over 200 years. You know, what they were taught. They were taught nothing but evil. They were taught nothing but how to be submissive. They were taught nothing but how to be afraid. They were taught nothing but negativity. They were taught nothing but self-hate, okay? This is what they learned in America. So most people actually just come to that conclusion and say, oh, okay, yes, that's what they know. You know, cycle of violence is what you know. It could be nature versus not your argument. You know, we all know, we say, okay, you're a product of an environment, then that's what, you, that's what you end up becoming. I'm sure your parents at some point did not really talk about um, um, racism to you like someone else's parents. But you didn't end up becoming a, a racist, did you? Well, no. Okay? I'm just asking you, yeah. Okay, yes. I'd like, but, I'd like to think that. Yeah, and you like to think that. So that's the point. You know, so, so why, why didn't you become a racist? Well, okay, well, uh, the, the re I'll answer the question, but the reason that I asked the question is because a couple of times you said, well, you know, this isn't the cycle of violence, this is human nature. It's the, it's the nature so, of violence. So my, my question is, what's the difference between, like, what specifically are you saying, well, this is the cycle of violence, as opposed to, oh, well, this is human nature? Well, the cycle of, the cycle of violence, you know, is, is, is the easy way out for most people, that's what I'm saying. And that's why, the the, that's why I came in with the politically correctness. You know, because we all want to be politically correct. You know, so it's very easy for us to cling to the cycle of violence theory. Okay, so what, that's my question, I guess. 
what is the theory of the cycle of violence? Just that whenever, whenever people go through violence, they dish it out to others? Well, yes, that's, the, that's, that's normal. You know, that's what I said, nature versus nurture. That's, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's the nature, that's the nurture aspect of it. So the question, is, the question is, would these people behave this way if they hadn't gone through those personal experiences and then translate those personal experiences into the way they behave later in life? So, repeat that question again? Okay, so like you described nature versus nurture, you said the cycle of violence is um, people who undergo traumatic experience right. involving violence then portray it to others. Like the classic, right. uh, the, part, the kid who was abused at home grows up and abuses his wife. Exactly. Same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. so, when I, um, so I just wanted to make sure I understood what you were talking about when you said the cycle of violence because you said, well, it's not the cycle of violence, it's human nature. Right. So I was just wondering what the difference was. Oh, the difference is we are inherently, by nature, we have the propensity to be good and the propensity to be evil. And that has to do with the choice we make. So, I don't know, maybe it's more a question of opportunism and the way that things, like, uh, the people who returned as freed slaves to Liberia. Right. Why then do you think that they pursued that? Is it that they were inherently evil people or that they were... Like you said, it was a cycle of violence. You said it wasn't. It was just, you know. It was not. It was not necessarily a cycle of violence. The cycle of violence might have played some role. Mm -hmm. I think if you heard me, I said that. Right. No. I, I guess my question is, to me, that sounds like classic cycle of violence. Like, what would make people enslave their own people if not something traumatic they've been through? Well, oh, good question. It's called power. The simple as that. The need for control. And that's the nature of man. That's where the nature. That's where the nature of us comes in. By nature, we have the tendency to be dominant. By nature, we have the tendency to be greedy. By nature, we have the tendency to be bossy. It's in us. So we cannot ignore that. These people had choice. Think about it. Why didn't they think about that? They didn't take one second to think. Wait a minute. I am black. These people are black. I have been through the same experience for over 200 years. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to do the same thing to them? You get the, no, that's, I, that, that's why it makes sense that would be... I can't think of any reason why people would do that other than, as you mentioned, just... Then for control and mind. power. Power and control. From greed, selfishness. That's the nature of us. Simple as that. That's what it was. It boils down to that. Because this went on for 127 years. And these people, they had no voting rights. Mm -hmm. You know, they were like second class citizens in their own country. You know, they could not hold any governmental position. So this was just absurd in a way. Mm -hmm. So you look at that and you say, is this cycle of violence? How do you justify that as cycle of violence? Well, cycle of violence doesn't have anything to do with race, does it? Cycle of violence doesn't have anything to do with race. Right, with it, race it, it applies regardless of race. Like R Regardless of race, you're right yeah. about that. Regardless of race. And, and if we want to go into racism, you know, I would ask you, what is racism? Um, treating somebody differently based exclusively or primarily on the fact they are, they look different from you. That's not race, that's prejudice. Okay. Uh, racism makes it, is systemic prejudice then. Yeah, that, you know, you just you just define prejudice. Racism is a wealth is a wealth based contest. Contest. Wealth. Wealth based contest, which wealth. is pretty wealth. Okay. Money. Based contest, okay. which is predicated on power. Um, are you saying that? Okay, so I understand that the people in power. I mean, just so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an activist as well. So. I love it. Okay. I love the debate. So, so um, I'm not sure whether you could point to wealth. Power, probably. But I'm not so sure about wealth. Because think about it, the, one of the most persecuted communities throughout history have been the Jews. And they're famous for being wealthy because they weren't allowed to have, to do, like, manual jobs or, or own property. So they could do with things that involved money. So that's why the Jews traditionally have had jobs where they have a lot of money, but there's still lots of anti-Semitism. Well, yeah, the, the Jews, they have money, but they don't have power. That's my point. So when you talk about wealth, I'm talking, I think maybe a better example would be power rather than wealth, because you can have money, as you just pointed out, without power. 
But yeah, but that's why you see the definition did not stop with um, wealth. Hmm. You know, again, I'm going to do it again. It's called race. Hmm. Racism is a wealth based contest that is predicated on power. Okay, I just don't know why you have to bring wealth in. Um, it okay. just seems an extra step. Obviously, if, if there's a power dynamic at play. Right. Um, but you can't have racism without race. Well, w without wealth, there is no... That's what you see. Black people can never be racist because we don't control anything. How about in Liberia? In if, if it was black suppressing blacks. That's not racist, that's not racist because it's, it's two different... It's the same race. Okay, how about uh, Israelis and Palestinians? That's not... That's, you call that racism? That's I, I don't know. I, I'm no. asking you. No, it's not racism. Okay, because they, they're both semi actually. Yes, it's, it's not racism. It can't be racism. So you see, because again, most people, you know, misconstrue the, the definitions of, of race and prejudice. We can be prejudiced. But without, we without power, you can't be racist. Exactly. Okay. It's a wealth-based concept. For those who don't have power. But in, okay, here's a question, in smaller circles, um, not talking about like the grand scheme of things, yes, you know, Caucasians have much more power than Asians. Asians have much more power than people of color than other people of color. I mean, there, there's a hierarchy that society, you know, uh, reinforces constantly, and you know that I understand is, is an endemic system of racism. Correct. But in certain areas, maybe certain places around the world, you know, people of color are the more dominant. Whether it's maybe areas of the country, uh, maybe areas where um, you know whites are minorities, or uh, spheres of influence, uh, certain types of art, certain types of music, where whites are minorities, and maybe black artists have more power in a particular industry than whites or Asians. Yeah, but but you you see, um, you can't you cannot um, um, compartmentalize racism, or oh, I would say departmentalize, for for lack of a better word, you know. Uh, that's that's uh, being intellectually um, insincere. If you this, is, this is a Mensa group. We, we do we like we like debate and we like intellectual. But that but that's what I'm saying. Mm. You know, I'm just pointing it out because I do not like being politically correct. You know, I, I just think that's 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 one of the biggest problems that we are facing today mm. in America because everybody is so politically correct that we do not want to call a white a white or black a black. And so for this reason, Donald Trump, for example, he took advantage of that opening. Mm -hmm. You know, and so there were so many disgruntled elements out there, you know, that did not have voice because they, they didn't feel the need, they, could, they didn't believe they could speak without people castigating them on the side, pointing fingers at them. You are racist. You are this. You know, so that's one of the problems. Oddly enough, his power base is almost exclusively undereducated whites. Correct. But you see, education makes the people easy to lead. Lack of education. But if the, it makes the people easy, and education makes the people easy to lead, but impossible to enslave. Easy to govern, mm -hmm. but impossible to drive. Okay, I can understand that. Right. So Trump actually um, seized on an opportunity on, on people who were not um, very well educated. He preyed upon a lack of education. <laughs> you know, so so yeah, I, so that's the reason why I decided I'm actually writing a book on that, mm -hmm. this very subject matter, because I, w I was born into this world and I asked myself the question, you know, did you know that because of what transpired in Liberia, that led to the Civil War, actually, because the indigenous people at some point, you know, they felt so oppressed that, you know, it imploded, and there was a coup. In 1980, mm -hmm. in Liberia, it was a coup. They took over for the first time, and guess what? They did not know how to rule. They did not know anything about management, and so it eventually led to the civil war in Liberia. I think you've had similar situations in South Africa. You've had similar situations. Basically, it governing is hard, right? Uh, and you know, uh, it is unfortunate that. People who may have started off well-meaning right. um, get swayed by the power, get corrupted. True. And um, then you have situations like Sierra Leone. 
Cheerios is a unique case. They're really all like very all these places. Very unique. You know. I, I come from a different school of thought. You know, it's funny because when I was I was very young, you know, in Africa you cannot have a debate with your with your parents like we are doing right now. You know. Um, just example for having eye contact. It's something I had to teach myself when I came here because we in our culture we don't look in the eyes of our elders when we speak, you know. So that's that was a culture shock for me. You know, it took a long time for me to get used to it, talking to someone and looking in their eyes, let alone having a conversation with your dad, you know, about politics or something like that. You know, my dad was on one side, but I had my own voice ever since. I was like a little rebel, <laughs> you know, in a way, you know, so I was very independent minded. You know, I, I had my own school of thought, I had my own philosophy. My dad had one way of thinking, I had one way. Uh, when he says something, I'll say, oh, well, this is what I think, you know, we'll have a debate. You know, that was something I was not very common in the African culture. But I had that opportunity to engage my dad and when it comes to politics, you know, and stuff like that. You know, so that's a big factor too. The, the cultural um, influence is, is just the cultural dynamics is just different. You know, in places like Africa, it's just different, you know. But the, the, the bigger thing is when I'm talking about politically correct, you know, even in Africa, we are guilty of that. You know, we, we always want to blame the white male, like you said, for most of the problem. Yeah, the white male has created a lot of problems in the wall. That's that's a fact. But when are we going to stop blaming the white men for all of the problems of the wall? You know, when are we going to take up a responsibility for ourselves and say, okay, this is what we could have done differently. This is what we can do different, you know, as a nation. There were good examples in Africa, countries like Botswana. They're doing good. Look at Rwanda. They went from genocide. Right now, you talk about education, science, and technology. They're doing really good. You know, so what happened? You know, we're going to keep blaming others for our on, uh, misfortune? No. That's Sometimes it's easier to blame people than to actually put work in. Exactly. You know, so that's why I decided to do that. And most people didn't really like that because I was actually pointing fingers at us. You know, I try to get that through the United Nations, you know, there were forces against my play, you know, because that subject matter is against the powers that be, you understand? So the status quo, they don't like change. So how's your book coming along? My book, I, um, I'm actually at the beginning phase of it, you know. You know, I like doing things that impact the world, you know, something that's, and it's also personal again, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think... It, it's going to spawn up a debate, just like we are doing right here, you know, but that's just my personal belief. I strongly believe, you know, the cycle of violence, yes, it played some role, but it was not the uh, determining factor in what transpired in Liberia. It was not. It's just the nature of men. It was, it's just who we are as humans. We have the propensity to be good, and we have the propensity to be evil. And it all is all based on the choices we make. And the opportunities we're presented with. True, I agree. Okay. All right. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Roddy, for coming down here. All right. For next month's lecture, the speaker is to be determined, but we do have a speaker in June, Stella Pulo, an actress from Australia, who discussed creativity and what to do with it. And I will let you know about future speakers. Remember, it's always the third Thursday of every month, 8 to 10, at this location, 777 8th Avenue in Manhattan. I hope to see you next month. All right. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Roddy. All right. Thanks, Rob. All right. That works, too. All right. right. Good luck. <laughs> nice Thank to meet you. you. Good, uh, good camera work over there. <laughs> Thank you.